Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting of the Public Works Committee to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived to the City's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly and or visually recording at this meeting. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Our first order of business is the appointment of a chair and vice chair for 2019. May I please have nominations for chair for 2019? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Clerk, and I move that the chair be Councillor Ferguson and that the vice chair be Councillor Denkel. Seconded by Mayor Eisenberger. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. <laughs> so, Councillor Ferguson, would you please make your way over to the dais and assume the role of chair? Well, welcome everyone to the uh, December meeting of the Public Works Committee. And I'd first like to thank everyone for their confidence in selecting me as chair of this committee. We have a, a lot of interesting things that are going to happen in 2018. I, I look forward to working with John Paul as our vice chair and uh, moving our agenda along. So we'll go back. So, Madam Clerk, is there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. I have just received an added notice of motion, item 12.1. Respecting Transit Day. Respecting? Transit Day. Okay. Uh, is that the only change? Yes, Mr. Chair. A motion to approve the agenda. Moved by uh, Pearson, seconded by Vanderbeek. All in favor? Okay, let's move on to declarations of interest. Does anybody have a declaration of interest? Okay, seeing none, it's gone to approval of the previous meeting. Uh, uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the September 17th as presented? Moved by uh, Esther Paul. Thank you. Just fold a blank there for a second. Yeah. What's your name down there? I'm your latest member. I didn't need a speech. I just needed your name. <laughs> okay. Well, I have control of the microphone up here. Just, just so you know. All in favor of approving the minutes? Opposed? That motion carries. Let's move on. There's no communications. Okay, let's move on to, uh, yeah, I may have trouble turning your microphone on today too, Mr. Mayor. Um, let's move on to uh, delegation requests. There's a request from Susie Scott respecting the installation of Ty as for a future meeting. Moved by Marula, seconded by Councilor Nan. All in favor? That's carried. Let's move on now to item seven, which are consent items. The first is uh, the Dundas uh, J.L. Greitmeyer Arena. Uh, there's significant issues there with scheduling and delays, so did anybody have any comments? Councillor Vandeveek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want, to, um, I want to say thank you to the city staff who've been involved in this issue. It's been um, an extremely frustrating and very disappointing time for, for all of us. And, um, I, I, I really want to say that staff have bent over backwards to try and resolve this. I'll use that word. And I think what's come, become most obvious to me is that we as a corporation have, um, have some work to do on our procurement policies and, and the wording in our contracts where we can. And I think that that the long and the short of it is that we are not uh, giving our staff or have not been able to give our staff the tools they need to be able to execute those contracts and keep, uh, keep projects going so that they don't end up in, in the way that the Dundas Library did and the way that, that 
uh, I'm, I'm only speaking about my ward, the way the Dundas Library did and the way that the arena did under this contractor. So <clears throat> I think it is important for the public to realize that um, staff have to work within their authority and our contracts bind us to certain things. And so the process becomes mired sometimes in, in, in the legalese and the things that we are in some areas bound by law to put into contracts. And so I am hopeful that through this, there may be an opportunity for us to relook at the things that we can affect and the way that we can give our staff um, the opportunity to be able to, to um, keep these things going and protect us and therefore protect ourselves. So having said that, uh, I want to go back to what I said in the beginning. Uh, the staff have been very helpful. The organizations that are affected have been uh, gracious and cooperative. And I think that there is more we can do for them in the future, and we will have to look at that. But it impacts, I want people to understand, it doesn't just impact the people who use the ice. It impacts the people who live in the neighborhood. It impacts the people at Dundas Little Theater. It impacts the people who use the swimming pool. And, and, and it, it is far-reaching. So I, I, to those people, I say, I'm sorry that it's been a long time, but um, I appreciate your patience and your graciousness. And, um, um, and to the people who are in the arenas that are affected because Great Myers closed, a big thank you to them too, because that goes well, it goes well beyond Dundas. So, so I'm hopeful that this will be a turning point for us and that we will be able to do something about uh, how we do things in the future. Um, anyway, I think that's enough, but thank you anyway. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Councillor Vinnie. I can't imagine what you're going through with your community, this thing being so late. It's a horrible embarrassment that uh, we have a contractor that just has no consideration, no respect for timelines and the impact it has in the community. So I, I believe, and I don't know whether, Rome, you can address this, but I believe you, there's procurement is bringing a report to AF&A on this particular contractor. Is that correct? You know? Through the chair, um, facility staff's working with both um, legal and uh, procurement, and there is um, a report that will be coming in, I think it's in mid-January. Okay, you can't get it in before then because uh, the fear is that this contractor wins some more projects before uh, we take any action. Through the chair, we've spoken to Tina from procurement. Uh, I think the earliest date is mid-January. She's working with the clerk's department. Okay. I will talk to you offline about that, and, and uh, but clearly some action has to be taken. So, Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Chair, I certainly uh, sympathize with the ward councillor, uh, and it's not just unique to her ward as well. So, uh, I guess, the, and I've raised this in the past, about, um, you know, it's not just about the procurement and what we can and can't do to ensure that we got accountability, transparency, and certainly getting value for the tax dollar. But it's also, uh, we need to understand the scope, responsibility, and power of the project managers uh, that are overseeing these projects. And I think we, uh, uh, at some point, I'll, I'll be requesting a, a formal uh, a report to understand the authority, the power of the project managers in uh, overseeing these contracts and whether or not there's more that can be done on, on that front. Because I mean, whether it's a road construction or whether it's an arena construction, uh, it's starting to rear its head more and more and more in regards to uh, uh, timelines not being met, uh, inferior work being done, um, and uh, there's got to be a solution. And I think we need to delve deeper into uh, uh, the processes. Thank you. Yeah, and as your as your committee chair, I'll undertake also to lead a program to hopefully put in place more uh, liquidated damages that have more teeth that, that forces a contractor. We saw it on the stadium. We saw it on other projects, and, but this one is the has got to be the poster child for. Uh, for putting in liquidated damages that provide teeth and encourage contractors to bring something back on schedule rather than just disappear for a couple of weeks and go and work on other projects. So uh, I'll undertake as your board chair to, to do that. So there's a, no other speakers on it, and there is a recommendation that we receive this report. It's moved by our uh, Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? That's carried.
move on to 7.2, which is intersection control, wards 2, 8, 9, 12, and 13. Is there any questions? If not, a motion to approve. Moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Denko. All in favor? That's carried. Report from the Hamilton Cycling Committee, dated September 17th, respecting cycling education in Ontario schools. Is there any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Parr. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to, through you to whomever on staff, I received an urgent uh, note, I think it was Friday afternoon, from one of the, I believe, members of the Cycling Committee, if not a recent past member, uh, regarding some missing knockdown sticks on the uh, cycling lane northeast corner of Herkimer and uh, Queen. But the reason why I bring it up now, the resident uh, had told me that the cycling committee members uh, had moved an emergency motion to have these barriers replaced in a fairly uh, quick fashion. I know this is a uh, cycling committee agenda we're seeking to approve here from September. Maybe it was the October meeting. I just don't see it in the agenda. I don't see an emergency motion. But I did uh, travel down that way a couple of times on the weekend and did see that all of the knockdowns are missing and there's lots of tire marks where the bike lane is right at that busy intersection. So I'm not sure who to speak to, but through you, it's are they aware Dave, of the Dave emergency Ferguson motion? And uh, is this something maybe right after this meeting I can meet with the appropriate staff offline to get the, the fix in, knowing that there is some cycling committee agenda that seeks to address Director this? Director of Engineering was giving me a signal. Is, there, is this something you could speak to? Or Dan, do you want to take it? Maybe, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe I'll just start. And for the benefit of the new members of uh, Public Works Committee, uh, Brian Hollingworth, uh, you generally you'll see him attending Public Works Committees. Now that uh, transportation planning has moved over into planning, there is a fair bit of overlap. And I suspect that this issue is one that uh, Brian could likely speak to. Brian? Uh, through the chair, um, Rachel Johnson uh, here is our uh, staff liaison for the cycling committee and she confirms that that issue uh, was captured and will or will be captured in the November minutes uh, so when the November minutes come to this committee it will be there uh, we're well aware of the issue and are following up on it that's right have they been repaired uh, I don't believe they've been repaired my guess is mr. chair just as a quick follow-up we probably don't need to wait for those minutes to come to some future. No, we just need to hear your staff say they're going to have them fixed this week. That's all we need to hear. This week? I didn't hear that. Okay, that's great. This week. Thank you. So Brian, will they be fixed this week? Look to my colleague, uh, Roads and Traffic, who has the staff to do that. But we, okay, will, engineering. We, will commit, we will commit to that. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions around the um, second committee? Oh, sorry. I do have it, yeah. Is it a constant thing that we're dealing with? Because if we are, we, I think we better think of another idea. I just, uh, I was on the committee just last week and I'm just learning, but uh, I know that sometimes barriers cause accidents as well. So I'm very concerned how often they break down, how much the cost is, and let's uh, figure that out. Thank you. Anybody from staff wish to comment on that? Is the technology the right technology? Uh, through the chair, uh, it really depends on the location, and uh, they do often break down more in the winter. Uh, that's why over time we're starting to move to more permanent protected facilities, um, you know, the concrete barriers and the like, uh, recognizing that these have some challenges with maintenance. Mr. Paul, anything else? I'm a biker myself. I think concrete, we have to really look at it if it is the proper way. Uh, you know, they might cause more accidents, I'm not sure, but I think we better look at it very careful. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, or Mr. Chair, and uh, certainly appreciate the report and the comments made. Um, I, I'll move the recommendation, and I, I certainly um, am, am pleased that Hamilton Cycling is moving forward with this suggestion, and I, I hope that the ministry will take this seriously in, in, in including um, an education program in the schools, and I think it should even go further now, especially with the amount of cycling that we have. I mean, I hear more and more, and I'm thrilled of cycling. I cycle myself, but I believe that we really need to make sure that the rules are followed on the roads. And, uh, you know, you've got vehicular track, you've got cyclists, you've got pedestrians. Nobody's following rules today. And, and, it's, and it, it frustrates me so much every time I get the request for speed bumps, the request for stop signs. 
And, you know, we can keep putting everything up there that we need to put up there, but we just need to continue to educate people. And I'm thrilled of, of trying to encourage through the school system the education on cycling. So I will certainly move this recommendation. I have no other speakers, so I need a second to the motion. Second by Councillor Pauls. All in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. Let's move on now to uh, discussion items because there is, there is no public hearings and no staff presentations. And the first one is 10.1, which is a volunteer committee budget submission. Uh, is there any discussion on 10.1? Moved by Pearson, seconded by, by Whitehead. All in favor? Carried. 10.2, which is the uh, volunteer committee for Keep Hamilton Clean. Is there any discussion? Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, and once again, congratulations. Look forward to working under your leadership. Um, I just want, as an outgoing member of Keep Hamilton Clean and Green, uh, having worked with uh, a number of great citizens, staff, and Councillor Collins and Councillor Pierce in the last four years, uh, normally we try to stay within our maintenance budget, which is paragraph A, the 18250 that we're asking for in 2019 operating. But in the B part, you see the additional requests, and if you read through the executive summary, it's been mostly because of the additional demand and complaints that we've had from law-abiding citizens regarding graffiti crime that seems to be occurring uh, more frequently. In spite of our preventative educational programs and efforts, it seems to be occurring in certain areas, including in nice, prestigious, beautiful areas like parks and trails and schools and areas like that. So along with the graffiti initiatives and, quite frankly, on the plus side, we're seeing hundreds of more volunteers over the years that want to be part of the cleanups of our areas where there's, uh, unfortunately, a lot of illegal dumping, debris, litter, garbage that's been discarded by some uh, ne'er-do-wells in our community, unfortunately. But it has uh, inspired and motivated a number of our great citizens, more of them to come out and be part of cleanup efforts. And as you know, April is our designated month through the year, Mr. Chairman, for cleanup efforts. So I just wanted, especially for the new members of Public Works Committee that are going to be delving into the budget more and more, typically the Keep Hamilton Clean and Green would try to stay within the annual maintenance budget, which is paragraph A. Paragraph B, though, again, it still has to go for budget deliberations the next few months, but that's why the additional request is there to help um, combat uh, graffiti crime. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Danko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to point out that the ask for $34,000 um, in total for the 2019 budget, um, we're leveraging 23,000 volunteers and nearly 14,000 bags of trash collected, which I think is a tremendous investment for the City of Hamilton. That's a, a great leverage of those taxpayer dollars. And just want to clarify that the, uh, the ask for paragraph B, the 15,615, is a one-time ask. Is that, is that correct? Is that a question for staff? Yes. Okay. Uh, Director of Engineering, who's going who's to handle that? Uh, thank you to the Chair to the Council. That is correct. It's a one-time ask. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Councilor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to you, to Dan, or anyone that can answer the question, last term uh, we implemented a, and, and Councillor Jackson triggered a memory, we implemented a proactive uh, graffiti enforcement program and as a pilot project. And I'm wondering what the status of the report uh, of its success or lack thereof is, um, and when, we're, when we'll be able to see that report. To you, Mr. Chairman. Who are you putting that question to? Whoever can answer it. This is related to graffiti, the pilot project related to proactive graffiti enforcement. Jennifer? Thank you and good morning. Through the chair, the proactive graffiti enforcement project, Public Works and um, the Planning and Economic Development Department have been working municipal, with municipal law enforcement and the two dedicated um, officers on the pilot project that uh, Council had approved. And um, we've had great success with the proactive support for victim assistance of graffiti. And the report is coming back to Council this spring on the comprehensive uh, graffiti management strategy. And there was a number of initiatives that uh, Council um, was looking for a response back for. So a fulsome report on all of those elements, uh, including working with our colleagues and facilities, um, the security office um, on a, a variety of other measures, and the police. We will be bringing back that report uh, this spring sometime. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, to you, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer, with respect to your preliminary assessment of it, uh, do you foresee recommending the continuation of the program? Or is it too premature to, to state that now? Through the chair, uh, we have in uh, the last couple of meetings with the Clean and Green Committee um, brought some of the preliminary information uh, regarding the uptake of the victim assistance program and it has been very positive, very well received by these uh, in particular repeat offender, um, repeat victims, sorry, of uh, graffiti on private property. So it has been very well received um, and I think residents are, um, our preliminary results are encouraging in terms of helping to support them to remove, which we know is a very effective means uh, to prevent future graffiti. So I think preliminarily we could say that it has been well received and um, a positive impact on addressing that matter in our community. Before and to you, Mr. Chairman, an additional component to that initiative was to enhance uh, video surveillance in, in parks uh, and, other, and elsewhere with respect to graffiti and um, even stealing of, um, of copper and other metal uh, issues at the, at the bridge, uh, the pedestrian bridge on the QEW. So through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, what's the status of that particular aspect? Through Chair, um, I can update you on the graffiti aspect. That will be included in this spring's report. Uh, in terms of other vandalism and theft, uh, I'm not sure, but we are working with our um, colleagues in uh, facilities, the security office, which are probably addressing a number of um, issues related to municipal property, and that will be encompassed in that report. Sorry, I, I guess the question is related to the cameras. If you recall, we were, we were discussing the cameras. We had a pilot project. And although I brought forward the motion, they all ended up in Ward 6, which was really <laughs> quite remarkable. Um, <laughs> so, but but what's the like status of that pilot project? Ward 6 so. better, do they? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the chair, yes, that is a component that we're developing um, the standard specifications for um, what kind of technology will best um, address the requests that council had asked us to report back on. So those options will be laid out with some recommendations um, this spring to enhance um, and, and or expand uh, that as a, a graffiti tool in the community. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I was going to raise something at the end of the meeting under other business, but you've allowed a little latitude under this report. I was just going to ask, there's a, I mean, it's been a problem for a couple of years, and I'm not certain what our, our policy is related to the acid etching on uh, bus shelters. So it is a form of graffiti. It's not the traditional paint on the side of a building. And I just noticed that, the, you know, the same familiar names that we've seen with graffiti tags on buildings and other public infrastructure are now showing up on the bus shelters. And um, I'm wondering what our policy is in that regard in terms of removing them. I'm assuming it's much more labor intensive and more costly than spraying it off the side of a building. And so I've just asked that maybe either as part of Jen's reporting back on our success to date as it relates to the proactive um, graffiti removal, if there's an opportunity for us to report back on our policies and procedures related to acid etching on bus shelters, I'd appreciate that. Jennifer, that Debbie, do you, can, you don't have to respond now. The counselor says he could accept on a future report. Uh, do you want to comment now? Uh, through the chair, I just would add that part of our graffiti management strategy being developed with multiple stakeholders does include transit at the table and definitely recognizing that they have some um, slightly different challenges with the etching that will be um, a component of our uh, strategy coming forward for sure. Great, thank you. Councilor Jackson, Jackson, just give me a good suggestion for the newcomers. Jennifer, can you just introduce yourself and your title? Good morning, thank you. Um, Jennifer DiDomenico, and I'm in the Policy and Program section in Public Works, and I'm working uh, for uh, Director Edward Soldo in Roads and Traffic. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the previous um, comments with regards to the bus shelters. And I know on our transit on the buses themselves, there was an initiative last term where the uh, we stopped putting the the plastic film on the windows to, to stop people from putting graffiti. And I think, did we go with a clear film? And if that's the case, is that something that can be looked at on the shelters? I'm just going to leave that, or maybe De Debbie would like to answer. Debbie? Good morning, through the chair. Um, so we are looking at uh, various applications. Uh, the issue around the bus shelters is the ability to put that clear film like we were able to do in the in the um, buses is uh, 
quite expensive and uh, labor intensive to remove it and to keep up with that but we are looking at uh, what other options are available testing some new cleaning products for um, um, graffiti that is not as a result of etching and we'll be working closely with uh, facilities as we embark on replacing all our shelters through the PTA phase two project so once we get that new infrastructure there to make sure that we're able to maintain it and not let it get to uh, the point where uh, it, it has gotten uh, recently. Appreciate that. I know staff will do everything they can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you. So item 10.2, I have no more speakers. So uh, a, a motion to accept the report. Moved by um, Nan, Councillor Nan, seconder by Councillor Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Right, let's move on to minimum uh, maintenance standard changes. This is item 10.3 that's before you. Uh, Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping that staff could provide a brief um, uh, explanation on the report, and then I do have two quick questions. Okay. Edward, you got, you're going to respond? Yes, um, thank you to the Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, the purpose of this report was to provide uh, committee and council with an overview of the maintenance standards that changed in, uh, in May. There's a number of areas where they have uh, uh, since changed. And what we're looking to do here is um, two, two recommendations. Uh, one is to uh, develop an updated policy related to our maintenance standards here at the city that will look at consolidating both minimum maintenance standards as well as our existing policies that we currently have. Uh, the goal there really is to develop a consistency across the board in terms of our policy. And what we'd like to do is come back to council as well with uh, the cost implications of each one. Um, and the second one is uh, related to a new provision underneath minimum maintenance standards, which allows uh, municipality to um, uh, designate uh, significant weather events. Um, and the uh, rationale behind that uh, particular recommendation is uh, in uh, extreme weather uh, events. Uh, this, um, the new minimum maintenance standards allows municipality to uh, adjust how they actually undertake the minimum maintenance uh, of the uh, roadways themselves. So what we'd basically do is, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, have almost a, a timeout in terms of when the minimum maintenance standards apply. This would only be utilized at very extreme winter events where we'd have two or three days of, uh, of uh, heavy snowfall, uh, and that will allow us to reduce our liability from the event itself. Um, so those are the main changes inside the report. It does speak to uh, some of the changes that were done uh, related to um, winter maintenance on bicycle lanes and sidewalks, uh, as well as some of the um, other um, patrol obligations that we have uh, through the minimum maintenance standards. So our goal is to come back to Council in the future with a consolidated um, uh, policy related minimum maintenance standards that looks at both of ours and the minimum maintenance standards from the province and uh, provide you with uh, that future report uh, sometime this year. Thanks, Edward, and through you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to be clear that the, the province, as part of the minimum maintenance standard requirements, is not suggesting that we alter our standards. Is it a case of then it's just the reporting of our standards for the purposes of, under, for the purposes of, um, I, I know insurance has been, and risk has been um, written into the report. So to be clear, we're not changing anything. Or, or, or are you suggesting through this report that we are changing standards in, in various parts of the organization? Edward. Thank you to the chair, to the councillor. Um, there are some new areas where standards have been applied uh, by the province, but we are not changing our standards. Our standards uh, in many of these areas actually exceed the standards from the province. So this is more of an accounting exercise and a reporting mechanism that's been required by the province, and we're fulfilling our obligations under the Act. Edward. That's correct. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's way to... Yeah, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm trying to understand the, uh, the, the implications of any uh, changes, but what isn't acknowledged here in, in this report, uh, and we know this in the context of climate change and, um, and even rain events, that, uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and it certainly happens in the winter as well, is that uh, we have, and we have microclimates uh, in Hamilton itself. So areas of the city of Hamilton uh, could get hit much harder uh, with a major snow event than others. So how, um, I guess, dynamic is this approach in regards to some of the, uh, the changes you're, you're, you're referencing? 
Uh, thank you, through the Chair, through the Councillor. Uh, the standards apply to all city roadways. Uh, in terms of the microclimates that we have, we do monitor them. We are well aware of the different climates that we have uh, in the various parts of the city. It, it, that is more of an operational item on when we actually initiate uh, the, our uh, services that we provide out there. So when we, we do monitor the weather on a, on a daily basis. We have systems in place to ensure that we're out there at the right time uh, with the resources we need to actually uh, deliver the main maintenance standards that uh, have been outlined here. So I, I think what I'm getting at though is, for example, let's just say the rural area, water down and, and, the, and that area may uh, be more in a snow belt. And, 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 and uh, when you talk about a major snow event, they may actually have it where the balance of the city isn't impacted by it. So when you exercise uh, these uh, um, different minimum standards, is that city-wide or is that would be geographic specific within the city? Standards apply to the entire city. Uh, it's just a matter of how much resources we put to deal with those significant events in, in those areas. So if we have an area that's getting more snow, we're applying the resources there to ensure that we meet the minimum maintenance standards. Okay, uh, and help me understand how we, we are uh, ensuring that our constituents are meeting the minimum standards now. And, and uh, last winter, I went out several times with our roads crew at 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, which we clearly identified that uh, areas of uh, certainly my ward uh, wasn't even coming close to meeting the minimum standards. And the reason we knew this is because we went to other district areas and we could see the stark contrast between uh, same collector roads, same material roads, and the, the, the snow that was removed. So it, it appears to me that um, from one district to another, uh, there's di different applications of the rules, and therefore, the same standards are not being met. To the Chair, to the Councillor, uh, our standards are being met uh, equally across all areas. It's just a matter of when we're fi finalizing the service in the area. And uh, I would... Uh, I would I'd take you to um, Appendix A, page 6. Uh, depending on the class of the roadway, we have a certain amount of time to actually respond to that event. So it could be anywhere from uh, 4 hours to 16 hours. So within that time frame, we are meeting the standard. Some of the districts or some of the areas might be getting done first. That's where the resources roll out. But we are meeting the standard in terms of the timeline when we actually have to get uh, the uh, roadways cleared. So my understanding, and I, and I did take pictures, uh, that we have snow-packed uh, uh, um, collector roads, major roads into neighborhoods uh, that were co uh, completely snow-packed. And then you go to the same roadway uh, in a different district, and it would be bare. So what is the standard? The standard is that we'd be bare within 16 hours if it's on a Class 3 roadway. It's just a matter of when we apply the resources. Uh, we can't be out there instantaneously across the entire city at the same time. So it's a matter of uh, how we're getting to that particular area. So, Mr. I think what I, I'm, I'm, I'm defining here is that uh, different districts apply different uh, uh, strategies in regards to re uh, snow removal. And when you're in a ward that has uh, a split between the two districts, I'm looking at the same classification of roadways. The, there's a stark difference in the actual uh, standards that are being uh, met. I've raised this before, and I will continue raising it. And you know, there is uh, certainly uh, on, on log uh, where I have actually gone out with the superintendent and verified these very findings. So I hope that we are, uh, in, from a policy point of view, ensuring that the superintendents understand and appreciate that where taxpayers are paying taxes evenly, uh, equally across the city relative to the services they receive, and they should be receiving those services. And it appears, and I'll be certainly monitoring it this winter as well, that the, uh, the standards uh, across any ward should meet those minimum standards, and no uh, area should get greater level of service than others. Thank you. Okay, I have no other speakers. Just one quick question before we go to approval. Um, Edward, just for the benefit of the committee. So you're saying this will have no impact on the 2019 budget. It may have an impact on 2020, but that will be in the report coming back to us. However, will you be able to show us a chart, because I didn't see it, I, maybe it's here, but I didn't see it, a chart showing the old and the new, so we can see what's changed when your report comes back? Uh, to the Chair, we, we can definitely do that. Uh, what I would say to you right now is uh, looking at these standards, we meet or exceed all of them uh, for the most part, so we don't anticipate uh, an increase in budget, but we wanted to have enough operational okay. data as we move forward to uh, provide you with that uh, when we come back with the, uh, the new standards. Okay, so on item 10.0, oh, Councillor Whitehead. Uh, 
Uh, on the other, on the uh, cycling one, I just want to understand, because you said you're going to um, look at the additional uh, uh, costs as we move forward, which is great. Um, I'm not sure uh, if we have uh, winter uh, numbers in regards to cycling, so it'd be kind of neat to match the, the dollars being spent versus the, uh, the usage. And the, and the last piece is uh, wherever we have um, separation, in some cases we included operating uh, uh, cost like Canon. Other areas like Herkimer we did not. So help me understand um, when you do this, some of the money's already being identified within the, uh, the implementation of those cycle lanes, others have not. So can you isolate where we didn't uh, um, in this, this report when you come forward, uh, areas where we currently have barriers but no operating uh, dollar, additional operating dollars were um, identified? No, thank you, Chair and Councillor. That, that's actually one of the main purposes of this report. As we move forward, we want to make sure we provide Council with clear understanding of what the costs are as we implement any more uh, facilities. So we have been tracking them and we'll be coming back with that exact information that the Councillor uh, asked for. Thank you. Okay, see no more. Whoop, Councillor Farr. I'm, I'm just glad the previous speaker uh, had brought this forward. I'm reading this on the weekend, I thought I should ask, and, and it slipped my mind. So through you to Ed, um, if we're measuring different costs, and in this case it's a seasonal snow removal, but um, you know, one of the strong arguments by uh, those who advocate for uh, this uh, higher order and, and sustainable type of uh, transportation, in particular on the uh, uh, lanes that are protected and separated, are we over time going to measure through you, Chair, uh, the savings with respect to the maintenance that is expected when you don't have vehicles every day, thousands of cars a day, driving in those lanes. Can we also measure that over time through you? Edward, do you anticipate there will be lower maintenance costs on the roads because people are cycling? Um, through the Chair to the Councillor, I'm going to uh, start and maybe Mr. Hollingworth would like to uh, add as well. Um, as we divert more people onto cycling, there is uh, obviously a, uh, a change in mode split. Uh, there will be less uh, cars uh, potentially driving on the roadway, uh, but at the same time we are growing as a city. So uh, to differentiate that cost I think would be very different, uh, difficult to do to identify the, that uh, savings in uh, maintenance costs. I'm not sure if Brian would like that. Councillor Park? I'm sorry, it would be difficult. So, so what causes through you, Chair, wear and tear on a road? What's the most likely culprit? I, th I think, Edward, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but I think what I heard you say is because a growing population, he doesn't see a reduction of vehicle traffic. But you can answer the councillor's question. So what causes wear and tear? Wear, through the chair to the councillor, um, wear and tear on, on any roadway is really uh, determined by the, the load that uh, the road's taking, and that uh, comes back to types of vehicles that you have on the roadway. So I, I, I maybe wasn't clear, and Ed's been great, by the way, so I'm really glad we're going to be able to converse both in committee, but obviously outside of committee we'll continue to. So I, I don't want um, to sound like I'm patronizing, but obviously bikes weigh a heck of a lot less than trucks and cars, so over time would a bike lane uh, not wear and tear as much as those lanes uh, that are seeing buses and cars and, 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 uh, and uh, everything else that's heavy. Through the Chair, to the Councillor, yes, intuitively they have less load, so they would have less wear and tear than any other vehicle. So I, I'm just trying to understand your answer then, Ed, through you, Chair. Why would it be hard over time to measure, you know, what we're putting into uh, repairing bike lanes versus car and bus lanes. To the Chair, to the Councillor, I believe your question was related to the, the number of cyclists that are out there uh, determining how many cars are on, on there. Um, we could come up with some theoretical uh, numbers, but uh, actuals would be a lot more difficult to do. Okay. Uh, in principle, though, like in theory, rather through you, Chair, would you, would you not agree that over time you're more likely to have to address in a capital repair way, uh, those lanes that are occupied by, as you note, uh, the culprits who cause the damage, the trucks and cars versus the lanes that only have bikes on them? Through you? 
that's basically what I'm trying to get at. It might help over time in the arguments where we maybe are paying for uh, some operational costs, as the previous speaker noted, that are, are a concern to some because you've got to get smaller equipment on those protected bike lanes. But over time, I think you're probably looking at a major savings because you are less likely to repair more often a bicycle lane versus those that the cars and trucks drive. I think uh, Edward has answered the question, but uh, um, I'll come to you next, Councillor Pauls. The, um, is there anything further you want to add to that, Dan? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, maybe this just language, but I think as a general premise, we could agree that uh, cycling lanes, the life cycle cost of cycling lanes is probably going to be less as a result of the issues that the councillor is identifying. I think it may be difficult for us to uh, determine with certainty what those are, but uh, as we go through Bill 6, we're likely going to have to start to turn our minds to what the differences are between the life cycle costs of a lane that has vehicle traffic versus the life cycle cost of a lane that has uh, a cycling infrastructure. Thanks, Councillor Pauls. Okay. Um, my response? Sure. <laughs> okay. I just wonder, we're talking about these bike lanes, which is great, and I, I'm a biker, but we're saying how spend more money. What is the percentage of people that use bike lanes? Right now, we have cars everywhere. We can't say, oh, let's put all our money in biking because everybody's going to bike in the future. We need to know how many people are using the bike, especially in the winter, especially downtown Hamilton, the winter where there's no, we don't want to spend all this money uh, uh, figuring that out. We don't have the percentage now. We do. We're talking about 10, 20, 30 years in, uh, from now where everybody's going to use bike lanes. I th I do, does staff have their fingertips? I know that us returning members of council have seen the percentage of motorists, percentage of transit, percentage of walkers, and percentage of cyclists. Uh, does staff have that? Brian, do you have it? Uh, through the chair, uh, I don't have the exact numbers by memory, but they are in the transportation master plan, and I can commit to sending them to the councillor. I think cycling's in the order of 3 to 5 percent, but much higher in the downtown, and collectively cycling and pedestrians are somewhere in the order of percent but I'll go I'm going by memory so I'll commit to send those numbers um, and just to add to the previous conversation I think it speaks to the importance of doing evidence-based planning uh, for any transportation decision which which we're committed to do the more we can collect volumes on usage uh, savings in design as results of different design impacts on maintenance uh, we're, we're committed to doing that in the future and have been I just don't see in the winter months, especially January, February, March, you know, 1%, 2%, maybe 3% of people using bikes, and we're uh, uh, trying to figure out how it's going to save that road. Uh, we have to uh, realize we live in a climate where there's snow, and we have to be smart about it. And uh, I'm a biker. I bike every, all the time, but sometimes I don't bike right in the middle of the roads downtown. But anyways... Um, that's all I'm concerned. We're talking about, uh, like um, my colleague here, Mr. Farr, saying, isn't it better, you know, we make sure we spend the money on those bike lanes, but we have to really think about it, and uh, I want to know how, what percentage it is. Well, we have those stats available. Okay. Brian's undertaken to get them out to us. Um, so, Councillor Whitehead. Okay. Uh, 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 across the roadway, and I don't dispute that uh, cycles, uh, cyclists will be a, lot, a longer life cycle on, on the, the laneways. But uh, the reason why uh, there's no real savings as a result of that is that it's still sharing the same roadway, and, and you still have the, uh, the underneath uh, uh, piping and, and, and utilities and, and, and so forth, and there's still life cycle on all of that. And those roadways, at, uh, based on their life cycle, you're going to curb to curb. You're not just going uh, to the edge or the de demarcation of those cycle lanes. So there literally wouldn't be any real savings on the life cycle cost of those laneways based on the nature of uh, 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 the things I've just identified. Okay, so that's uh, if no more speak of oh, Councillor Farr. Chair, being a newbie to public to works, this. through you to staff real quick, what... What's more likely to cause a pothole, a bus or a bike? Vince is riding it. Uh, 
Is that, was that, that's a rhetorical question, I assume, is it? I'll take it that way. Okay, so Councillor Collins moves 10.3, seconded by? No, it's, there's actual recommendations on it. Okay, so you're moving the recommendation. Yes, sir. Okay, that's good to know. So uh, moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Marula. All in favor? Yes. Carried. I'm going to move on to motions now, and I'm going to ask uh, Councillor uh, uh, J. John Paul Danko to take the chair for a minute. If you push your button, I'll turn you on. Okay, we're heading into the budget season, and um, uh, so I have a, a motion that I'd like to place today, and I'd like to waive the rules because we are. Just, uh, there's another motion. I had another motion. I'm on 11.1. Uh, 11 oh, you're right. My apologies. My apologies. I'm going to take the chair back now. We'll pass that back. <laughs> you can hit your button to turn it off if you like. So at the interview subcommittee, there's um, Marula. Is there any other volunteer? Second, Councillor Nan. So uh, they're moving Councillor uh, Councillor Collins is moving Councillor Marula and Councillor Nan. Seconder to that. Turn your microphone. I can't hear you. We need three councillors, please. You need three? Yes. Is there a third one that would like to volunteer? Councillor Pauls. So we have three. So moved by uh, Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you. Let's move on to item 12, notices of motion. Now, uh, Councillor uh, Danko, I'll let you take the chair. Thank you. So I'd like to move to weigh the rules to start with because this is something that's. Uh, have they been distributed, the motions? Yep. Okay, so I'm, I'd like to move to waive the rules since uh, it's just for a staff report and it's coming back, uh, or it's, the results have to come back for the transit day, which is coming up shortly after the next public race. Seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. Oh, sorry. sorry. The speaker, um, is that now? <laughs> Councillor Collins? Nope. I'm waiving the rules. No, on is me. I'm waiving the rules, no. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll you have to ask all in favor. All in favor? <laughs> Okay, so I'm now I'll move the motion. And Councilor Collins, did you still want to second this? I, I, yes. Okay, so moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Collins. And this is a transit matter, whereas the Public Works Committee approved the purchase of a passenger count system for $2.2 million. And whereas we're going into uh, year four of the transit master plan, and whereas the significant investment has been made in the first three years of implementing a 10-year plan, Therefore, be it resolved, the staff report back at transit day the results of the passenger counts and list of routes that are carrying less than 15 passengers per trip at peak times, and secondly, the staff report back on transit uh, day with the review of assumptions made when the 10-year transit study was done and compare them to the actual results or issues like ridership on issues like ridership and population. So just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, to speak to this is... Uh, we saw in, the, in our first two budget days that there's a significant increase in the public works budget directed towards transit. I think everything else is around the 1.5 percent. But transit, uh, both HSR and um, DARTS are seeing a significant increase. And this is all part of continuing to implement the 10-year strategy, uh, transit strategy. And there was a lot of assumptions made uh, four years ago when this report was put together. And I just want to test those assumptions. There's an, uh, and two, for example, our ridership. And, and I hear that ridership in 2018 may be trending back up, but the previous years it trended down. And, and so in, the, in year four, what was our assumption on ridership? What was our assumption on population? And what was our assumption on everything else that was in that report? Just to make sure we're going down the right, right road, because four years is a long time. Ten years is probably too long. And, and every year we're, we're seeing staff come back, as they should, to implement the 10-year strategy because that was the direction of council. So I just want to get this information back. How are we doing? And on the passenger count, you know, uh, transit is something that's always in demand. And we've added a lot of new routes. And we saw a significant increase in 2018 on our transit budget and, and proposed again for significant increases in 2019. So where these routes have been added, but also all our existing routes, What's our passenger count? We've spent the $2.2 million to have the technology to know 
how many riders are on these buses. And I would like a summary, a, uh, a list, of the routes that are uh, carrying less than 14 passengers uh, at peak times, which is 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, the reason I picked the 14 number is that was the number that various transit directors have said when you can justify a transit line. So uh, the motion is before you, and it, once again, it's just for a report back on Transit Day to help us make the right decision on that significant budget increase that our General Manager of Public Works is proposing. Thank you. Councillor Collins? And thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy to second it. And I think the timing is appropriate in terms of uh, what we have on the horizon in terms of the PTIF 1 and 2, and, as well as obviously the fourth year of the transit strategy. So I'm, I'm happy to second the motion. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm just curious to know whether the, um, just as an aside, whether the passenger counts, um, the, the system that we invested in, I know we were working out some of the bugs last year. Has that been fully implemented in time to receive information that may be presented on Transit Day? Through you, Mr. Chairman. It's a question to staff. Yep. Yeah, Debbie. Um, through the chair, so we completed the installations of all our automatic passenger counters at uh, um, the, just the beginning of this year, we have spent uh, a significant amount of staff time um, trying to uh, ream from that data the information that we need to make some decisions based on um, the data that we've collected, and we will be able to report back to that on transit day. So we are seeing that information. I just also want to remind council, um, we just implemented um, year four of the transit strategy. Um, sorry, year three of the transit strategy in September of this year. So we've just added additional service uh, from September uh, uh, of this year. So we didn't add any additional routes. We just increased the service levels on the um, various routes that were identified as part of the 10-year strategy. Very good. Thanks for the information. No further speakers? Motion uh, call the vote. All those in favor? Motion passes. Is there anybody opposed? Okay, that motion carries. I'll take the chair back now, uh, Councillor. Okay, is there any other notices of motion? Seeing none, uh, item 13, general information and other business. So we uh, can have a motion for moving to second to approve the amendments to the outstanding business list. Moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Marula. All in favor? That's carried. There's closed session minutes. I have a motion to approve the September 17th, 28th closed session minutes. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Pauls. All in favor? It's carried. And motion to adjourn. Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor? Carried. Thank you.